So last week we have started with the uh, topic called the Kingdom Living and uh, we have taken this as a perspective from the book of Acts and we have uh, learned how Jesus began his ministry and he began to proclaim the Kingdom of God and he began to teach the disciples through parables and teach the people through parables and stories so that people can understand what the kingdom of God is about. And after Jesus died, we know that the Holy Spirit came upon uh, the disciples and the followers of Jesus. And they began to live a resurrected life. They began to live a life which was filled with the Holy Spirit. And as we read through the book of Acts, uh, we find many essentials for the kingdom of God. And through my reading, I have taken four important things which I've shared last uh, week. Uh, that is, the first one is the discipleship. Second, the lordship of Jesus Christ. Thirdly, spiritual mentorship. And fourthly, partnership in ministry. Due to lack of time, last week we only saw about discipleship and that too, uh, we saw very briefly. So we talked about who is a disciple. A disciple is a follower, is a learner, is a imitator. Mm -hmm. A disciple is someone who follows Jesus. Mm -hmm. That means as uh, a Christian, when you give your life to Jesus, we decide and we make a decision. Uh, we make a commitment to follow Jesus Christ. That means Jesus becomes the Lord of our lives. And we, uh, we follow him no matter what. We also saw what is discipleship is all about discipleship is the process of becoming more like jesus in the way he talks in the way he acts in the way we behave in our attitudes uh, we saw that uh, so uh, today i'm going to carry this forward and talk to you some more let's go to the next few slides brother discipleship so in matthew chapter 4 verse 18 to 22 when you look at this we see the call of the disciples. Jesus was on this earth. He lived 30 years. He was baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit. Now he walks uh, into the Sea of Galilee, uh, beside the Sea of Galilee. And he saw uh, two brothers, Simon Peter and Andrew. And he said, come follow me and I will uh, make you fishers of men. And at once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Jabedee, and his brother John, they were in a boat with their father Jabedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So we see the call of Jesus Christ on the disciples to come and become disciples of Jesus Christ. So when we accept Jesus, when we give our life to Jesus, Jesus is also giving us a call to be a disciple. That means it's not just for a uh, uh, it's not just for a moment of time, but to be a lifelong follower of Jesus Christ. We also see from Matthew 28, 18 to 20, after uh, Jesus rose from the dead and before he ascended to heaven, he gave the call to disciple making. He gave the call to disciple making he said uh, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me go therefore and make disciples of all nations so jesus not only called us but he also gave us the commission or uh, what we call as the great commission to go and make disciples of all nations i was hearing to a very short uh, message by a pastor named john craggle he's the lead pastor of mission grove church usa I will share the video later in the WhatsApp. He gives a very practical definition uh, about what is a disciple, what is a disciple. Matthew 4, 19, it says, come follow me. And uh, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. Next slide, brother. So here is a practical definition he gives. He says, come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. In Matthew 28, 18 to 20, we know Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. So out of this text, uh, this pastor John Craigle has come up with two, three important steps. That is, when Jesus calls us, he calls us to follow him. It is simple. 
Okay? So following that means a relationship with God. So Jesus, when he calling, he calls us, when he calls someone, he's calling us into a living relationship with God. That means you are in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Secondly, who is a disciple? The disciple is someone who fish for people. So we accept Jesus, we have received the gift of salvation, eternal life, and now God is asking us to fish for people. Jesus said, come and I will make you fishers of men. That means relationship with unbelievers. That means we not only believe in Jesus and follow him and worship him and sing and come to church and fast and pray, but also we have relationship with unbelievers. That means we witness Jesus to the world. We are light and salt in this earth. Many a times people think that we should not be uh, involved with people who are in the world. Maybe we should not make friendship with the people. But when you look at the life of Jesus, Jesus was eating with sinners. Okay? And so we also ought to have relationship with unbelievers and witness. Because only when they see the light in you, when you are near to them, they will see the light uh, in you and the darkness in themselves and they will follow Jesus Christ. Thirdly, fellowship with believers. Thirdly, fellowship with believers. That is, relationship with believers, other believers. That means you are a no man island. That means you are not walking with the Lord alone. That means you are also having fellowship. So, it is a call to discipleship is a call to community. So when Jesus called the disciples, they were not just alone in their homes, but the Bible tells us in the book of Acts that they sold their houses, they sold their land, they sold their property, and they were all gathered together. Every day they gathered together. So I want to stress on this point that many times we may think, okay, alone I can grow in the Lord. Maybe I don't have to come to church. Maybe I don't have to attend Bible study. Maybe uh, it's not necessary. Many people think like that, but I think it's very essential that we have relationship with other believers. That means you come to church, that means you have uh, a group where you can uh, encourage one another, pray for one another, where you are uh, uplifting one another. So that is what a disciple is all about. Follow Jesus, fish for people, and fellowship with <coughs> believers. Amen. So in the, from the book of Acts, we see two important people who were actually living out who is the disciple is. First one is Stephen, who is the first martyr, and Philip the evangelist. These were actually not in the group of the 12 disciples, all right? They're not in the 12 disciples list, but these people were the ones who were deacons. They were serving the church. Stephen was helping with uh, serving, uh, 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 serving and uh, cooking probably. So we see that Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, he began to proclaim the word of God. And we know that he was stoned to death. So Stephen is the one who not only followed Jesus, but also he, uh, he proclaimed the gospel to other people. And he became a good follower of Jesus Christ. He was a great disciple. Secondly, we see Philip the evangelist, or we can say Philip the deacon. It is often assumed that this Philip was one of the 72 men Jesus sent out. When Jesus was alive, he sent them out saying, go and make, go and disciple, go and uh, preach the gospel and come and give me a report. So Philip was one of the original seven deacons who were selected to serve in the church in Jerusalem when they set up because people were together and they needed uh, food like we have the food ministry. So he was in the food ministry and serving. So now. When the persecution broke out, you know, Philip left Jerusalem and he became an evangelist in Samaria. Now, you know, Philip was used to, uh, uh, be, uh, Philip was used by the Holy Spirit to bring the gospel to an Ethiopian eunuch. Okay, so who was the Ethiopian eunuch? A member of the court of Candace, the Ethiopian queen. So Philip. Uh, when he found this eunuch, he preached the gospel. The eunuch was reading from the book of Isaiah. He was not able to understand. So Philip goes and he, uh, he makes him understand. And then and there he gets saved and gets baptized. And so this is the Philip we are talking about. He not only followed Jesus, he fished people. Here we see he fished 
a Ethiopian eunuch. He preached the gospel immediately. That person was saved. Later part we see that after 20 years, uh, we see that Philip is mentioned again uh, while still while he was still in Caesarea. Paul and Luke and others were traveling to Jerusalem, and they came and stopped by the home of Philip. Now when they came to Philip, they found that Philip. Uh, had four unmarried daughters in his home and they were all had the gift of prophecy. That means Philip not only followed Jesus, he also fished for people and he also made disciples. So here we see that he made, his, uh, he made disciples from his own home. Four of his daughters, they began to prophesy and they were called as prophets. So we see a perfect example of who Jesus is. Uh, who a disciple is from the book of Acts, from the life of Philip. Well, next slide. Uh, so now going to what is a discipleship, my definition of discipleship. Discipleship is the journey of knowing God, becoming more like Jesus and bearing fruit for the kingdom of God. Discipleship is the journey of knowing God, becoming become more like Jesus and bearing fruit for the kingdom of God. That means when you fall, when you, uh, that means in this discipleship, it's a journey of knowing God. That means we, throughout our life, we strive ourselves. We, we uh, make effort to know Jesus Christ. In Philippians 3.10, Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his suffering and become like him in his death. Philip, uh, sorry, uh, Paul, who was a great theologian, who was worthy of having five theological PhDs, such a man, he says, I still want to know him more. I have a desire, that means we see a desire of Paul uh, uh, to know God more. So as a Christian, as a disciple, sh disciple we, uh, we know that we are in a journey of knowing God. And so we have to make all the effort to know Jesus. All through our life, every day of our life, we have to make effort to know God. You know, where I stay, where I go for jogging and I, I, I see every day people jogging there, making so much of effort, you know, for a good health. And I see them sweating. Sometimes I, I, when I see old people just doing so many rounds and I could only do one or two <laughs> rounds, that's it. And I, I look at them, they, their belly is flat and they're sweating, they have good uh, muscles. And I try to run one time and the second time I'm really tired and so halfway I walk and come. And so what I've seen is that, okay, these people are making effort. They're having so much of desire you know, to build up a good body, to live a healthy life. And so it's, it's same with our discipleship journey. We make effort, we take initiatives, we are intentional in being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Secondly, we become more like Jesus. First John 3 10 says, Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will be <clears throat> like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we, we will see him as he as he really is. So our, our goal in our life should be to become, a, to become more like Jesus. And God also is in the process of making us more like Jesus. He's shaping us, he's molding us. He is making us like Jesus Christ, his son. And that's why in Philippians 1, 6, it says he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And so we have to understand that we ourselves, with our own effort, with our own knowledge, with our own spirituality, uh, we tend to become more holier, godlier. But we have to understand that it is the work of the Holy Spirit and God is at work in us and He will He will make us like Jesus. But we need to make we need to take initiatives and be willing and obedient and then we can become more like Jesus Christ. Thirdly, bearing fruits for the kingdom of God. John 15, 8 says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciple. A new command, I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you also must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. 
John 13, 34 to 35. So as a disciple, we bear fruits for the kingdom of God. That means we, we bear spiritual fruits. People look at us and they will say, okay, this guy is a Christian. The, the, uh, the people in Antioch saw the disciples and they said, they said, these are Christians. For the first time in Antioch, they were called as Christians. So we bear fruits. We do good works. We help people. We support people. We pray for people. We encourage people. We generously give for the kingdom of God. Uh, so, dear friends, discipleship is a long, lifelong journey. It's a lifetime process. All right? So, but God is asking us to be in this process. But He's not just leaving us, but He's going to be with us and help us. When we look at the life of Paul, he became from, pers from persecutor, he became from persecutor to a preacher of the gospel. He was a persecutor. But he gave his life to Jesus. When he gave his life to Jesus, when he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus, he gave his life and he wanted to become a disciple of Jesus. That's why he said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And we know somebody who was a persecutor of Christ became the preacher of the gospel, preacher of, of, of Christ. So we see Paul as a perfect person who was in the process of discipleship. And until the, until the last day of his life, he began and he was working on that. And that's why he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Nextly, we will look at the cost of discipleship. So following Jesus has a cost. And Jesus clearly mentioned in Luke 14, 25 to 33, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And we have to bear our cross and be after Jesus Christ. And that is why many people in this world say, oh, well, it's not easy to follow Jesus Christ. It's very, very tough. And that is why many people are afraid to come to Jesus and to follow him. And Jesus lays out this thing saying that hate your father, your mother, your children, your sister, your brother, even your own life. So there is a cost to it. And Jesus says, for which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost? So Jesus warned those who wanted to follow Jesus. He said, well, you want to follow me, but count the cost. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. So, and finally he says, you have to deny yourself. You have to deny yourself. And many at the time of Jesus, they wanted to follow him because they wanted to get uh, into the kingdom of God to be a cabinet minister, maybe get some money, maybe have some power. But Jesus' kingdom was spiritual kingdom and these people did not understand. And they were coming to Jesus, so Jesus warned them. Jesus said, well, you're, you're, you're planning to come after me, follow me, but these are the things you have to forsake, you have to deny, you have to give up. Well, <clears throat> that means in, in following Jesus, it involves self-denial, a life of sacrifice, living a life of sacrifice. That means when you follow Jesus, it involves commitment, a firm decision. That means you're not turning back. Jesus said, whoever put your hands on the plough and turn back, you're not worthy of me. So you, when you follow Jesus, when you decide to believe in him and follow him and become his disciple and make disciples, that means you never turn back. You're firm in your decision. You're willing to uh, deny yourself and willing to obey Jesus Christ. Willing to obey him no matter what. Showing obedience to his word and bearing fruits for the kingdom of God. In the Old Testament, we see the life of Abraham. God called him at the age of 75. At that old age, Abraham was willing to deny his family, give up every wealth that he had in that land. And he, he left the land, he left the property, he left his family, and he was going to the land that God is showing. I was just reading a commentary and it says that in those days, Abraham had a double story building. 
You know, they excavated and they found out that Abraham lived in a very good place. He had a double story building, but he left it. He gave up. He gave it up because God said, Abraham, follow me. And this is what it involves in our life, willing to give up things that, uh, and leave behind the past. Secondly, we see the disciple, uh, we see Moses. Moses also, he was willing to give up the right to be a king, called as a, a king's son. He could have become the next king after Pharaoh, but he gave it up because he was looking for the kingdom of God. In the New Testament, in the book of Acts, we see the disciples, the followers of Jesus, they all lived a life of sacrifice. They lived a life with commitment and, and they were willing to obey Jesus Christ. Well, last week I mentioned about how each one of the disciples died. When you see the list of the disciples, how they died, Andrew, he was he marched them by crucifixion, bound, not nailed, to an X-shaped cross at Patre, a Kai, hung alive for two days, exhorting specta spectators all the time. Bartholomew, being skinned alive and crucified, head down by the idolaters of Armenia. James the Great, beheaded or stabbed with a sword, then we see James the Lesser, son of Alphaeus, who was the first bishop of Jerusalem, martyred in his early 90s by being thrown from a pinnacle of the temple at Jerusalem, then stoned and head bashed in with club. John the Beloved, he had a natural death. Jude, who wrote the book of Jude, martyred by being beaten with a club, then crucified. Judas Iscariot, we know him. Matthew, Matthew uh, the, or Levi marched about 60 AD by being stacked and speared to the ground, preached the gospel in Ethiopia, Africa, and was killed for questioning the morals of the king. Simon Peter, we know he was crucified upside down, and uh, then we see Philip said to have been tortured, impaled by iron hooks in his ankles, and hung upside down to die. Simon, called the Gilead because he was associated with the sect, thought to have ministered mostly in Jordan, martyred by crucifixion in Britain in 74 AD, and then sworn in half. Thomas, martyred, thrust through by spear in India. John Mark was di uh, dictated to write in the book of Mark, martyred, dragged to death. Matthias, a stone and beheaded at Jerusalem. Apostle Paul was beheaded by Emperor Nero. James, the half-brother of Jesus, thrown, uh, saw 100 feet of a wall. So all these people, he survived the fall and was beaten, beat him to death with clubs. Look at the hor horrific way they all died. They were willing, they sacrificed uh, their life in following Jesus Christ. So there is a cost to discipleship. It's not going to be easy. We have to understand as Christians, as discipleship, disciples of Jesus, that life is not always going to be merry and happy and glad and we are going to have a lot of money and good health. No, we are going to encounter persecution. Like we are blessed to not have any persecution here, but go to countries in many of the countries where the gospel is uh, they not allow the gospel to preach and they go through a lot of hardship and persecution. The early church, they were so committed in spite of horrific, horrific uh, persecution they had. But they, they knew the cause and they followed Jesus Christ. Now let's look at the way of discipleship. The way of discipleship. When I say the way of discipleship, when we give our life to Jesus and say, I want to become a disciple of Jesus, that means we decide to unfollow the word. We decide to unfollow the word. Now Jesus, he said, uh, follow me. The first said, let me go and bury my father. The second said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me go back and say goodbye to my family. You know, when Jesus is calling us into a relationship to be his disciple in the discipleship, that means we unfollow the world. That means we unlearn the worldly system. You know, we are fed with so much of worldly system. The people, the patterns, the principles of the world. We have to unlearn them. We have to unfollow the people. 
and we have to unfollow the ways and means of the world. You know, once say, Lord, let me go and bury my father and mother. Let me go and say goodbye. Jesus said, no, come and follow me. He who puts his hand on the plow and turns back is not worthy of me because Jesus knew that we are somehow caught in the web of lies. We are caught in the world, the patterns and the principles of the world, the ways and means of the world that when you go, you are not returning back. So we get caught up in, that, in, this, in this world and we cannot become the disciple of Jesus. It's very hard. So Jesus said, count the cost. When you're following me, you have to better understand that you are giving up all those ideas. Whatever ideas you have been embracing from your childhood, from uh, up till now, you are giving it up. You are giving it up. When we see the rich man in the Bible, this man comes to Jesus, he falls flat, and he says, good teacher, what shall I do to have eternal life? Now Jesus said, go and... Uh, uh, you know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, uh, honor your father and mother. And he said, Lord, I have been doing this all from my childhood. I have been keeping them from my youth. Then Jesus looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing, go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven. Now Jesus could have taken him in this team so that he could get some sponsorship for the food ministry, for his uh, tra for his travel, <laughs> okay, for his, <laughs> for his clothes or maybe to meet the needs of his, uh, his Bible school. But you know Jesus, he, was, he looked at him and he said, you need to give up because this man, this guy was a rich guy. He had everything you can imagine. And this guy was a very influential guy. He was a religious leader. Uh, uh, he was a religious leader in the temple and he knew everything. He has experienced what life is about. But he lacked one thing. So Jesus said, you need to give up. Give away because these are going to stop you from following me. So what Jesus was telling this young man, this rich man is that you better give up everything. Otherwise, this will not allow you to follow me with all your heart. So we have to understand that when Jesus is calling us, we need to unfollow the world, the worldly system. Many people think that following Jesus is really boring. You know, young people and many of the people in this world, rich people, they think it's not fun. It's not adventurous following Jesus. Oh, you need to fast and pray and, and give tithes and uh, attend those prayer meetings and do this and do that. But Jesus was very clear. He said, this is not a religion. It's a relationship. Christianity is not a religion, but it's a relationship. And people who fully gave their life and committed their life to Jesus, followed Jesus fully, they understood what life in Jesus is all about. You know, do you think the life in Jesus, following Jesus is boring? And it's not fun? It's not adventurous? When Jesus was alive, you know, we know that uh, once he fed 5,000, more than 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. My God, can you imagine only five loaves and two fishes and he could multiply them, bless them. And so many of them ate, more than 5,000. In fact, historian says maybe about 15 to 20,000 people, they ate. And do you think it's not adventurous, it's not, uh, it's boring? No, Jesus was literally like a magician, was doing this amazing miracle where the food was multiplied. They were giving and the food was not over giving and the food was not over and they ate full the bible tells us and there were how many baskets full were left 12 basket full was left then we know that once the disciples were in the boat and jesus was walking towards them and they saw jesus and they thought oh he's a ghost and then jesus reveals himself and then peter says i'm going to walk on the water jesus at your word i'm going to walk on the water and Guess what? Peter walks in the water. Do you think it's boring? Do you think it's not adventurous? Peter walking on the water in the sea. It's so adventurous. It's so fun. So walking with Jesus, being with Jesus, following with Je following Jesus is not boring. It's, it's adventurous. It's fun. It's a lot of fun. 
And twice in the Bible we see that the disciples could not catch fish all night. They struggled all night. And finally Jesus comes and says, throw your net to the right side. And when they threw the uh, net on the right side, after working so hard whole night, they could not catch a single fish. And now when they threw it like a magic, they could catch so much of fish that the boats cannot contain and they were not able to pull the fish. Do you think it's boring and not adventurous? It is so much fun being with Jesus. You know, when we really decide ourselves to walk with Jesus, to have a relationship with Him, you know, we are going to, we are really going to enjoy. Many people in this world, they think that the riches, the education, the name, the fame, the influence they have, they can actually buy anything. But, you know, the Bible tells us that unless they, unless they believe in Jesus, they cannot have eternal life. The life they have now, it is not, it's just temporary. It's momentary. And they think that with my riches, I can live a happy uh, life. I can live a life that is really good. And this, ma this young man thought the same thing. But in spite of having all the riches, he still lacked one thing. And that's why he came to Jesus. You know, Jesus talks to us about the rich fool who made storehouses. He had so much of abundance of crop. And he had no storehouses no, uh, like So he decided that he's going to make new barns, new storehouses, and he's going to store. And then after he did everything, he said, he said to himself, you have plenty of grains laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. And, but God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? You know, the problem with many rich people, many people in the world who doesn't like to follow Jesus or God, you know, they think that every, they have everything, but they don't know when they will die. We don't know the death may come any moment and everything is lost. It's like the rich man and Lazarus. This rich man, when he was on this earth, he ate and he was uh, enjoying his life. And, uh, but when he died, we know that he went to hell and uh, Lazarus, who was the beggar, uh, picking, up his, picking up the trash and picking up the pieces of his table, he went to heaven and he was, and the rich man who went to hell, he was yearning, desiring and thirsty for water. He said, let Lazarus dip his fingers and give me a little water, drop of water. So that's what happens. So we need to unfollow the world, the system of the world, the riches of the world. Otherwise, we cannot be the disciple of Jesus. Secondly, it is harder and easier. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24 to 26, He said, take up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself. Is it really easy? Denying yourself, denying everything you have, giving up your riches, you know, giving up the enjoyment and the pleasures of this world. Many think, oh, if I follow Jesus, I cannot, maybe I cannot go to the movies. Maybe I cannot go to the party. Maybe I cannot use, uh, what the, what's, uh, like, uh, the kind of words I want to use. But it's very hard for them. It's very hard for people. But Jesus again said, take my yoke upon you. Come to me. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's both ways. It's harder and it's easier. But when you come to Jesus, you taste and see Him. You walk into a relationship with Him. And that will be the greatest, adventurous, funny, uh, life filled with fun and so much of joy. He said, there are pleasures in my right hand. When we come to Jesus, it's harder and easier. But Jesus said, with me, when I'm in your boat, no matter the storms of life comes, I'm there with you till the end of the ages. And I'm going to calm down the storm. I'm going to give you peace that the world cannot give you, the joy that the world cannot give you. That's what Jesus says. So the way of discipleship. Thirdly, in the way of discipleship, you lose your life to gain it. You lose your life to gain it. Jesus said, for who would... Whoever would lose his life will gain it for my sake. You will find your life. Even though you may give your life, but you will find it. You know, he says, he said, uh, what, uh, he said, uh, Jesus said that if a wheat 
if a grain of wheat does not die, how can it produce? You know, when you look at the seeds, unless it is dead, it cannot produce. And so we have to understand, unless we die in ourselves, die to ourselves, die to sin, and uh, then only we can be resurrected in Jesus Christ. So, in the way of discipleship, you lose your life to gain it. Can everyone say, lose my life to gain it? Lose my life to gain it. So in a way that you are not completely losing your life, but are actually you are gaining eternal life. So that's what Jesus said. Now Peter said, Lord, we left everything. We followed you. Well, and uh, uh, we have left our profession. They were really making good money with the fishing they were doing. All right. And they had a very thriving business. But they said, Lord, we have left everything. And initially they followed Jesus because they thought they will, he, they, they will also be in the kingdom and the army of Jesus. But later when they realized, they said, Lord, we have left everything. Now what does it profit us? Now Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or bro mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel. Who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time? Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. So friends, we have, we see Jesus is saying that, okay, you have decided to follow me. I told you, leave your mother, leave your father, leave your brothers, leave everything and follow me. And, but I'm promising you that even in this world, you're going to have hundredfold blessing. Do not think you're not going to have house. Do not think that you're not going to have other brothers and sisters, other family members. Do not think you're not going to have a fun, adventurous and, and very rich life. Jesus said, no, you're going to have. Maybe life is going to be ups and downs. Maybe after you climb every mountain, there will be a valley. But with me, in your boat, life is maybe harder, but it's going to be easier. And I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to provide your needs. And I'm going to be with you. So that's what. So you lose your life to gain it. So in the way of discipleship, we unfollow the patterns of the world, the ways of the world, the people of the world. Secondly, it's harder and easier. Thirdly, we lose our life to gain it. We have to understand that our life... 1 Peter 1.24 says, All people are like grass and their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. You know, but Jesus is saying that your life is secure in my hands. Once you decide to follow me, once you decide to walk with me, I'm going to take care of you. And Jesus told them, go make disciples. And he said, lo, I'm with you till the end of the it is that means until Jesus comes back, he's going to hold us, he's going to uh, take us forward, he's going to be with us. When we fall down, he's going to pick us up, but he's going to be with us. And so, friends, I believe that through this, uh, through this teaching or through this preaching, we have been blessed. And so let us commit ourselves to become a disciple of Jesus and understand that we are in a process of discipleship. It's a lifelong journey. It's a, it's a lifelong process, but it's going to be really, really filled with fun and adventure and Jesus is going to lead the party. Thank you and God bless you.